Hello, welcome back to Oral Surgery Journal Club. I have a very interesting article to share with you all today. This paper comes from 2003 and was published by a Dr. Laurent paris nar who is a French dentist, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. This paper concerns short implants. So basically, they used a computer simulation and finite element analysis to look at implants of various sizes, starting from six millimeters all the way up to 12 millimeters, and they applied occlusal load, and they were able to evaluate the different stresses that were applied to the implant and the surrounding bone. And their conclusion actually was quite interesting. They found that the implant length did not have any consequence as to the stress distribution. So short implants and long implants had exactly the same amount of compression and tensile stresses acting on the implant and the bone. And implant length was completely inconsequential. So that was their finding. Of course, it's only theoretical, but this paper served as a very early support for advocating the use of short implants. Um, that's why it's so important to be familiar with this paper. Now, there's two, two negatives. One is it's theoretical, and two, this was published 20 years ago. So we're going to review this paper, but then I'm going to conclude by looking at some more recent literature, because of course in the last 20 years, we have some newer literature to, to entertain and take into account. But let's sort of start with this paper. So this paper served, like I said, as a very early support for the use of short implants. Um, prior to that, there was a dogma that the longer the implant, the better. And only recently is it becoming more and more acceptable to use short implants. But why theoretically might one assume short implants to be inferior or have a worse outcome? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. One is you have less bone surface area and less osteointegration. Another reason would be that you have a high implant to crown ratio leading to overload and which in theory should eventually lead to marginal bone loss. And lastly, another concern would be that short implants even if they were to have the same amount in millimeters of marginal bone loss, the percentage would be quite different. So for instance, if you have a six millimeter implant and it sustains only two millimeters of marginal bone loss, that's a third of the implant. And compare that to a 10 millimeter implant, if that same 10 millimeter implant sustains two millimeters of marginal bone loss, well, that's only a fifth or 20%. So you can see that short implants, it will be the same amount of marginal bone loss will consume a greater percentage and more exposed threads can lead to earlier failure. So for all those reasons, one might have assumed implants to be worse. Now, the, what we're looking for in today's paper is not necessarily the crown to root ratio or the percentage, but we're talking about stress. This, like I said, you might have assumed that a longer implant could better tolerate and distribute the stresses applied to the implant. But what this paper found is actually that's not true, that the implant length had nothing to do with the stress distribution. So let's go through this paper a little bit slower. So this was a finite element analysis, which is using a computer simulation. Here they're showing you how they use the simulation for all different sizes of their implants. They were all, of course, the same diameter, just to keep one variable the same, but the lengths varied. Um, they did, this is very interesting. Of course, this is like a side point, but I just found it interesting, so I'm gonna share it with you. In order to, mod to model this on the computer, they have to, of course, put in different material properties. And so there is, this is previously calculated in other papers and well-established, but there is a Young's modulus, which is uh, the modulus of elasticity. So that means if you were to apply a load or stress to a solid material, how likely, how stiff is that material? How likely would it be to deform or bend? And we have different strengths. So titanium is very high. So meaning titanium is very stiff and unlikely to bend. And compare that to cortical bone and cancellous bone. And we have objective numbers so that we can put this into our computer simulation and better understand how bone works. So we have a number of 14 GPA when it comes to cortical bone and only 2.5 GPA when it comes to cancellous bone. So just that is an interesting point I wanted to point out that we know just from this, these studies when it comes to mechanical properties that cortical bone is five times stronger or stiffer than cancellous bone. Of course, so that just goes into the computer simulation here. They're talking about how else they did the simulation. They then layered cortical bone, one millimeter cortical bone, followed by the rest of it was um, cancellous bone, except in a couple models that use bicortical anchorage. So what that means is they would do one millimeter cortical bone followed by a large amount of cancellous bone followed by another one millimeter of cortical bone. Now, when clinically do we have circumstances where we engage clinical bone? Sure, all the time. When we engage the piriform rim or the maxillary sinus, then you're engaging both cortical bone, then cancellous bone, and then a second cortical bone. So that's bicortical anchorage. 
Now, of course, this is important because clinically we know bicortical anchorage should lead, in, at least in theory, to a better primary stability. All right, going back to the study. Uh, so in their simulation, they applied a occlusal load of 100 newtons and they applied it at a 30 degree angle. And that's of course important because when we chew, our bolus is not hitting our implant in an axial manner, but of course it comes at all sorts of different angulations and this is meant to represent mechanical chewing. Um, then they're gonna be looking at the different stresses applied to the implant as well as to the surrounding bone. They're looking at both the compression forces and the stress forces, the, t the shear stress forces. So the compression forces are supposed to represent marginal bone loss. At least in theory, what we believe is the more compression on the bone it should lead to inflammation and therefore resorption of the marginal bone. When it comes to stress forces, the thought process there is internally that can lead to mechanical or implant failure with those tensile stress forces. So we're going to be looking at both of those forces in this computer simulation. And finally, their results were, as I said before, quite impressive. The implant length did not influence the bone stress location. The implant length, despite the length, no matter where, no matter if it was a six millimeter implant or a 12 millimeter implant, the stress was located at the level of the neck in almost all cases. And anything more than three millimeters, the stress intensity was fairly low and inconsequential. Um, next, they looked at implant displacement. Now, this is very different than implant stress, we're looking at if the implant moved. So they're applying a computer simulation load repeatedly, banging, banging, banging on that implant and wanted to see if the implant were to displace. Why is this clinically important? This pertains only to primary stability. Of course, once it's osteointegrated, there should be zero implant displacement. But when it came to implant displacement and therefore primary stability, they did find that implant length mattered. So the short implants did displace more than the longer implants. So the conclusion from this was that the longer implants seem to have a better primary stability. Uh, here's, a, here's a diagram showing you how their computer simulation worked. This green layer is the cortical bone followed by cancellous bone followed by a second cortical layer. So in this model A, this was a Unicort, uh, monocortical and then B would be bicortical. So that's how they did it um, in their simulations. Here they're showing implants of various lengths. Like I said before, this was the mechanical properties that they utilized. And finally, this, was a, this is showing you the distribution of both the compression and tensile forces acting on the bone, not on the implant. First, we're gonna just talk about the bone. And here's the stresses. And you can see in this figure, both in the figure on the left, this is representing a six millimeter implant, and the figure on the right is a 12 millimeter implant. And if you look at these two pictures, they have nearly identical amounts of stress. Both compression and tensile stresses were identical, and it didn't matter whether it was six or 12 millimeter implant, all of the stresses were located at the coronal aspect of the implant, or the coronal aspect of the bone. And therefore, you would expect marginal bone loss, but there shouldn't be any difference in terms of the marginal bone loss, depending, irregardless of the length of the implant. And then one more picture that's worthy to see is the implant stresses, not the bone stresses. Now let's talk about the implant stresses. And once again, the findings were nearly identical. All the stresses were confined to the coronal aspect of the implant. And the longer the implant, it almost had no consequence because the stress levels was so insignificant at this point for the longer implant. And so the findings of this paper, one more time, we're just going to sum it up. This paper was a super interesting paper where they looked at short versus long implants and how that affects the stress distribution. And they found that when it comes to stress distribution, length doesn't play any significant consequence. And therefore, this, at least from a theoretical standpoint, would advocate for the use of short implants. Now, like I said before, this is only theoretical and this is 20 years ago, so time has elapsed. What do we? What else has the literature said over time? So I'm gonna talk just briefly about a couple of other papers as we get closer and closer to modern uh, 2021 data. So first I'd like to talk about this paper which comes from 2010, and they looked at um, specifically early failure, and they looked at short versus long when it came to early failure. And what you might have guessed 
based on what we saw in this paper from Dr. Parisnard in 2003, it was supported in this paper when it came to early failure, there was a difference. So short implants did fare a little bit worse than longer implants. So let's get to the numbers. He had 1,600 implants, so that's a fairly sizable N. And when it came to length, the largest loss was observed in the short implants, so about 10%. So that, that means 10% failed, 90% successful when it came to short implants. And that was statistically different from long implants. Long implants only failed about 3% of the time so about 96 or 97 percent of the time they were successful so on the one hand short implants have a 90 percent success and longer implants have a 96 percent success and that was a statistically significant difference but again we're only looking at early failures and that is exactly what you might have expected from our previous paper that when it comes to primary stability or what this paper looked at not primary stability they looked at implant displacement which should correlate with each other they found that the short implants did have less primary stability and therefore you might have guessed that they have more early failures but that's only early failures what happens after that period according to what we read from Dr. Perry Snard assuming you've osteointegrated after that period of early fail of early failure once you get beyond that is there any difference between the short and the long and what we're seeing from Dr. Perry Snard no it shouldn't matter that once it's osteointegrated at that point moving forward the marginal bone loss should be the same for both implants and you and the shear stresses internal stresses on the implant itself mechanical failure should be the same for sure for short versus long so you might expect that when it comes to overall success it would be similar and this is pretty much supported by another study this is a fairly recent huge meta analysis and this comes from Dr. Char Char Kunovic who I'm definitely but butchered the name, I'm sorry, but I very much appreciate his studies. He does a great work, and I'm, oh, in my channel, I'm going to more and more talk about some of his meta-analyses because they're so thorough and they're so well done. But this study was actually done just this year, and he looked at 350 publications and thousands of implants. So he had 25,000 short implants and 150,000 long implants. So he's aggregating just a ton of data, and he's coming up with really good numbers. And of course, if you have numbers that big if your n is that big then you could appreciate a statistically significant difference even if the difference is small so that's precisely what he found he found the difference but again the difference was quite small so when he aggregated all the implants together and all those studies he found that short implants like a four to six millimeter length and that's quite short they had a failure of four percent compare that to an eight or a nine millimeter implant that had a failure rate of a 3.8 percent and compare that to a 10 or 12 millimeter implant that had a failure rate of 2.7 so again you can see from this paper which really aggregates all the numbers quite well there is a slight difference but again it's fairly small now I know that's statistically significant but is it clinically significant that's a, that's a fair question to think about so the short implants they failed four percent of the time and the longer implants failed three percent of the time that's a one percent difference but clinically that may not name it that may not translate into much many more failures so that's one thing to think about when it comes from this this is the newest paper this paper would certainly lead us to think that short implants are fairly good um, maybe they have a slightly worse failure rate than longer implants but again very slight and that begs the question what about the grafting and that brings me to my last paper that I want to talk about because until now we've been focusing on short versus long implants but we're not one thing we're ignoring and we're not taking into account is the grafting procedure and the grafting procedure into itself has its own complication and failure rate and I don't want that to be ignored so this fourth paper actually compares short implants versus long implants in grafted sites and that's an important thing to think about because when we look at um, this paper this big meta-analysis there's one important confounder that has to be mentioned they're only looking at short versus long implants but they're not talking about grafted sites and if you want to get if you bear with me I'll try to explain this confounder because it is a really important confounder to appreciate presumably most long implants are placed where where you have the bone if you're looking at a meta-analysis and you're not putting you're not comparing apples with apples we're not putting all the implants in the exact same site most of the long implants were placed long because they had the bone available versus most short implants were placed short because they didn't have the bone available 
i.e. they're placed in the posterior maxilla, which is known to be the weakest and the least dense bone, and the worst bone for, for implants to have primary stability. So it may be that the short implants failed more than the long implants, not because of anything intrinsic of the short versus the long, but maybe the short implants were predominantly placed in the posterior maxilla, and the longer implants were predominantly placed in the anterior mandible. And if even a, a certain percentage of that, that would confound this entire meta-analysis. And that's why you may see a 3% failure rate versus a 4% failure rate. So finally, in this fourth study, what they're looking at is not just any long implants, but specifically long implants placed into grafted bone. And what they found is when they looked at that, actually they did find that short implants had basically the same amount of success as longer implants placed into a grafted site. So I hope you guys found that interesting. A lot of to discuss, a lot of interesting papers. Um, I know I certainly found this interesting. I could tell you, despite all this evidence, I have a personal bias, just the way I was trained. I still opt whenever possible for longer implants. And even in situations where it's six, I think I still opt for grafting and long, and that's just my dogma, that stubbornness inside of me. But I'm curious to hear from you guys. What are, you, what are your thoughts? Have you guys fully embraced short implants? Are you still sticking with grafting and longer implants? Anyway, I will see you guys on the next episode, and take care.